an interview with Mr. Siddle Chalmer, the spy with the Grassford College disaster. Who when he went down the mine? Fourteen, fourteen years and two months. Why did you go down the mine? There was no other work in the area at the time. What were the conditions like before the disaster? Very, very hot. And very uncomfortable. And roads were very, very low. What sort of lighting was used down the mine? Gas. Gas lamps. They need you really up. Was it dangerous down the mine? Very dangerous. He is not the time. Were the wages good? Yes. Uh, my wages when I started were ten pence a day for eight hours, eight hours <laughs> work. <laughs> How many hours did you work down the mine when you first started? Uh, for, for a week. We used to work 48 one week and 56 the next. How did the fire start? Well, the, the, the professors have never been able to solve the fire, but they have assumed that there's an electricity fault. How does electricity start a fire? Well, it creates a spark. A broken, a broken cable creates a spark. It then ignites the methane gas, which causes the explosion. That in, that in itself is followed by dust explosions, creating a, a huge area. And how did you escape from the disaster? Well, now, this, that's going to be a very long story. You want to remember it right from the beginning, don't you? Well, uh, at two o'clock in the morning of the 22nd of September, 1934, we were having our snapping, just sat down, and there was a big, thund low, thunderous crash, followed with a huge cloud of dust and a strong gust of wind. When everything had cleared, a young boy came up to us, said, you can't go out along the main road, that there's a great big fall and everything's blocked up. At that moment, we saw a couple of lights go up the face. So one of our chaps said that we'd better go up and follow them. We followed them up the face and went down the top road until we came to two doors where there was a shot fire standing with his back to them. He said, you can't go through these doors at all. I've just tested and it's not very good. At that moment, somebody pushed one of the doors open and a big cloud of smoke came through it and he closed it quickly. Then he said, I don't know about going up the return road. There's a man lying there. I don't know how he's lying there. What's the matter with him? One of our mates, Teddy Andrew, I'll find out. He said, I'll crawl and he pulled me out. He crawled to this chap, Bert Samuels and myself, pulled him up by the feet and he had all this other chap's feet. We got him out. When we turned him over, we found he just appeared to have just died. And he was warm, but there was no chance of reviving him. A little discussion followed. Jack Samuel suggested anybody that's got any clothes to spare, take them off and use them as a fan. Crawl as low as you can to the floor. We decided on them that move. After we'd gone about 100 yards, we turned around and there was no other one following us. There was only six of us. We decided to carry on. After we'd gone about another 100 yards, there was a black wall facing us and the chap in the lead said, we can't go any further. There's uh, a black wall here. He said, ah, one of them shouted, look on your left, you'll see a ladder. Go up that. Switch over onto the other side and you see another ladder go up that again. We climbed up that and by then we were starting to get a little bit tired and very hot. We got to the top of this ladder where it was much higher than where we'd come from. We decided to have a sit down. We only sat down for a couple of minutes. We were afraid to stay too long. And we stuck off. 
by then I was in the front. We got so far up that we got to a slip road called the Clutch. And a man shouted to me, Tom Fisher, come back, lad. There's something moving by the Clutch. Let's go that road. Well, I turned back, and Tom carried on in the front. We got to where there was supposed to have been four doors, but the biggest piece of them was about six inches. It'd been blown to smithereens. When we got to the last of those four doors, there was a man lying on his face. I knew him very well. I turned him over and we had a look. There was nothing we could do for him. It appeared he'd been dead a good bit. So we carried on to buy the clutch. When we got to the clutch, all oh, hell had been let loose. There was a fire burning. The return pulley was hanging down. The horse lying on its side and a man lying at the side of the horse. They were both dead. When we looked, there was another man kneeling at the side of a wagon. He was dead. Well, we had a look at all, we seen these huge falls, and we didn't know which way to go. But then there was one of the birds, and we said, come on, we'll take a chance. We'll go on level with this leg over this fall. But then when we went on the top of this fall, three pieces of light, great big stone was hanging. We had a zigzag past them, but we found out it was one continuous fall with very small breaks in it. Well, it took us quite a long while to get up, and we were happy to be very careful. We were frightened out in our lights. When we got very by the pit bottom, we come to work the, where the timber had fallen straight. We had a look, we found a little space in it, and the birch handle was very small. So we decided to drop him through first. Then we landed our lamps to him and he helped us down. When we had a look, we could see lights coming from the pit bottom. It was then Jack Samuel said, lads, we've made it. We're on our way home. When these men came towards us, one was the under manager with the other men. They'd come to find out what was wrong. We explained to them what had happened. And one of these men said, I think you have come the wrong road. Well, it was then near impossible for us to come to any other road. And we still don't know why he said that. But after a little bit of a chat to the other manager, he decided to let us go. Told us to go home and call an amnesty. When I got then, I suddenly realized I'd only got a pair of shorts on. I put my coat up from by the engine house. We got by the pit, a man gave me an outfit over all of us. As otherwise I would have been naked at home. We got up the pit. When we got up the pit, we were met by a doctor in the ambulance We was given something to drink to make it all vomit. After a good while, we had to sit down and say, you come and examine us again. He said, right, well, lads, you can all go home now. Did you think the work was more like slave labor? Oh yes, definitely slave labor because the, the nature of how you had to work just with clothes and a very, very scarce pair of shorts. Absolutely nothing else. And you weren't allowed to sit down at all in any, in, from the beginning of the ship right to the end of the ship. Did the conditions improve at all after the disaster? Oh yes, without a shadow of doubt. The men of Jesse Corey paid the price of all safety in all the mines in Britain. They were 100% safer in every respect after the car opened in 1935. How old were you when you left the mine? Uh, I was 53. What's your feelings about the memorial being put up 50 years after the event? Well, I think uh, it was something that has been achieved, but it should have been achieved at least 45 years before that. Have you ever met the Prince and Princess of Wales? Oh, yes, I had the pleasure of meeting them at the, the colony when they unveiled the, the memorial. And they were very, very pleasant people. And I had quite a good conversation with him. Just to finish off, Mr. Chalmer, 
in the last question, were there many accidents before the disaster? Oh, yes. It was a regular occurrence, very well known in the area, and in all the local colonies, and for someone getting killed very, very often, and very serious broken limbs, because of the nature of the bad supports, which was only at the time, very slender wooden props. Thank you, Mr. Chalmers, for giving me this interview.